Good evening. My name is Gregory Hemming. I'm the co-founder along with Robert Cervelli of the Center for Local Prosperity and I remain with that organization as senior advisor. And I'm your host this evening for tonight's dialogue, Crossing to Safety, Discovering Our Common Home in Atlantic Canada. I acknowledge tonight that we're in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, and that we acknowledge them as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Since about 2014, the Center for Local Prosperity has been involved in putting on dialogues, conversations uh, in, uh, in and across Atlantic Canada um, and, and into, the, into the US and other parts of Canada as well uh, on really basically local economics, uh, climate resilience uh, and uh, food security. Uh, and in 2017, in collaboration with the Thinkers Lodge, uh, we began to have additional conversations specifically on climate change. Um, the, uh, and tonight's dialogue is really about that. Uh, uh, and uh, in the weeks to follow, this is the last of this dialogue series. In the weeks that follow, uh, the Center for Local Prosperity uh, with uh, Robert Cervelli as the, uh, as the host is going to continue uh, discussions uh, on, uh, it's called the Thinkers Lodge Summit on Nuclear and Climate Crises. Uh, and it really occurs between September 30th and October 3rd in the Thinkers Lodge in Pugwash, Nova Scotia, and virtually as well. And we have attendees signed up now and speakers that, that move, move us really from Vancouver to Moscow. There'll be, uh, and the lead up to that, and that is in, uh, in late sept in, uh, uh, September 30th, uh, we will host uh, three one hour webinars uh, featuring some of these panelists from seven to eight o'clock on uh, August 25th, September 7th and September 14th. And if you check the, the website for the Center for Local Prosperity, that'll keep you updated on those and how to participate. Uh, participate in those. Uh, tonight's discussion um, really started with the, the Bob Cervelli and I <coughs> and a couple others really looking at the climate situations and, and just, uh, made the decision that the future is very stark, that without dramatic changes and changes quickly, that we really face societal and ecological collapse. Um, so what, what we're going to look at tonight is uh, as those systems break down, people are going to have to be relocated from different parts of the world and from within our own communities to, um, to, uh, to survive the crisis, to move to higher ground, to get closer to agriculture productive land, to get clean air and water and to, in a sense, flee from some of the hardships of, of, of war. Um, and so we're, the, the plan is to see if a place like Atlantic Canada might be uh, a host for a number of climate refugees. And what we're trying to figure out is what pieces need to be in place, financial pieces, political pieces, economic pieces, to... Um, to see if Atlantic Canada is ready to accept climate refugees with the idea that if that's true in Atlantic Canada, it might be replicable, replicable to other places. I was going to introduce our, our participants tonight all at once, and then I was going to turn it over to Scott, uh, Scott Leckie to, uh, to, to open the dialogue. Tonight we have Richard Reock with us in London, England. Uh, Richard has devoted his working life to peace, human rights, and the environment. In service to that work, he served as the global media chief of Amnesty International, was a trustee of the Rainforest Foundation, and is still active in diverse peace initiatives worldwide. 
raised in a Buddhist family in Canada. He served for 12 years as the president of the worldwide Shambhala community and was part of a high level delegation to the Rohingya refugee camps on the Bangladesh Myanmar border. And in 2018, he helped launch the Buddhist humanitarian project. Cecilia Jimenez Damri is a human rights activist an international humanitarian lawyer specializing in forced displacement and migration with three decades of service in NGO human rights advocacy for the Asian Pacific region. As a lawyer and teacher, she has served as a senior legal advisor and trainer with the International Displacement Monetary, uh, Monitoring Center of the Norwegian Refugee Council in Geneva. As the national director of the Internally Displaced Persons Project and the, uh, of the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines, and as the government repre uh, representative to the Philippine Traditional Justice and Reconciliation Commission of the Autonomous Region of Banks Moro in southern, Phil uh, southern Philippines. Robin Bronin works as a human rights attorney and has been researching and working with communities forced to relocate because of climate change since 2007. She is a senior research scientist at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and co-founder and executive director of the Alaska Institute for Justice, a non-governmental organization that is the only immigration legal service provider in Alaska. The Alaska Institute for Justice houses a language interpretive center training bilingual Alaskans to be interpreters and also serves as a research and policy institute focused on climate and social justice issues. Scott Leckie is the founder and director of Displacement Solutions, a nonprofit initiative designed to assist refugees and displaced persons to return and recover their original homes. He is an international human rights lawyer, academic, author, social entrepreneur, environmentalist, and recognized as one of the world's leading global housing, land, and property rights experts. At the age of 25, he was already being described as the leading human rights scholar and as an international human rights pioneer. Over his almost 30 years of human rights, career, uh, human rights work, he has carried out human rights work in more than 80 countries in all of the world's continents with the exception of Antarctica. His intervention, interventions have helped to protect hundreds of thousands of people against planned forced evictions in the Dominican Republic, Panama, Philippines, South Africa, Thailand, and Zambia. He has worked successfully to restore housing, land, and property rights to tens of thousands of refugees and internally displaced people in Kosovo, uh, Georgia, Timor, and Albania. His efforts led to the recognition of the housing, land, and property rights of communities threatened with displacement due to climate change and assisted in the fundamental reshaping and strengthening the body of land, housing, and property rights under, the inter under international human rights law. He is currently a visiting professor at the Australian National University in Canberra, Alaska, uh, Australia. And while Scott may be modest about some of his uh, success stories over the last 30 years, he's not modest about the fact that he is a devoted follower of the Grateful Dead. In 2019, uh, Scott's displacement organization as a lead agency and the Center for Local Prosperity as the ground on the ground agency agreed to work collectively to initiate a pilot safe haven for climate refugees here in Atlantic Canada. Over that time, our two organizations have drafted a working plan aimed at drawing national and international attention to the many institutional, financial, social, political, and architectural issues that must be addressed 
if such an aspiration were to become a reality. Tonight's dialogue is a further a furtherance of that mission. But before I turn to Scott, I'd like to take a moment to thank all the previous 13 speakers and the many participants who have helped us over the last eight weeks to, uh, to hold these dialogues. They have shared their experience and demonstrated their devotion to making planet Earth a long-term, fair, and just place. Um, uh, and they recognize that all places on Earth must respect equally the people of a region and the land, animals, vegetation, water, and air, and recognize as well that people revere their physical surroundings. Uh, and they need and deserve a stable, productive economy that is accessible to those with a modest income. And further, that all communities must be determined to treat the environment and their people as equals and to recognize both as sacred. I began this dialogue series fully aware that societal collapse, societal breakdown was likely and that Atlantic Canada is no exception to this predicament. Monday's release of the IPP, uh, IPCC sixth assessment is a stark reminder that humans are the cause of the, the problem and that the situation will likely get worse. While the IPCC report does not, uh, what it does not highlight, however, are the vast and ever-growing numbers of people not willing to settle for collapse. This for me is reason to celebrate, reason to remain hopeful. David Corton, co-founder and board chair of the Positive Futures Network, and yes, a journal for positive futures, has put in his 50 years of service to earth by keeping this in mind. He says, to avoid being overburdened by the magnitude of the work before us, we need to keep three things in mind. Although the work may seem at times lonely, we cannot forget that tens of millions, perhaps hundreds of millions of people are already engaged in the process to work towards some sort of resolution. Second, Every contribution, no matter how seemingly insignificant, helps shift the balance. And third, we can each do no more than our individual best. Indian activist Vandana Shiva has maintained her optimism and composure over the last 40 years by learning to detach herself from the results of what she does. Because, she says, the results are not in my hands. The context is not in my control, but my commitment and yours is to make the deepest commitment with total detachment from where it will take you. It is this combination of deep passion and deep commitment that allowed me, she said, to take on the next challenge because I do not cripple myself. And one last story, <clears throat> a dear friend and one of my favorite nature writers, Barry Lopez, was traveling through the, um, the Nambi in Nambia in South Africa with a few people on an expedition. They slept in the desert now and then where they could and one morning he woke up and spotted a chanting goshawk in the top of a, of a dead tree. That particular acipiter hunts other birds as well as reptiles and small mammals. Like all avian uh, predators of its type, the goshawk's hunting success depends on depth perception uh, that is made possible only by having two very keen eyes. The bird, he said, had its back to me as I approached. 
it was gazing intently at the expanse of the savanna grass, searching for a creature upon which to swoon. As I drew closer, the bird rotated its head and I noticed that his eye had been torn out of its socket. The hole was rimmed with blood matted feathers. In a moment, it turned back to survey the Havana, ignoring me. And he said often, when I want to give up, I think of that bird and how many other severely wounded birds there are in the world still hunting. So with that bit of background and a story or two, I would like to turn this over to Scott to kind of set the stage on where we're at in the world with climate displacement, climate displacement havens. And then our, our speakers are um, prepared to comment anywhere along the line. So Scott, I'd like to turn it to you. Thank you very much, Gregory. And greetings everybody from uh, the lower right-hand corner of Australia. I'm speaking from the land of the Boonarung people who have never ceded sovereignty over this territory and who never will. Um, I'll just speak for a few minutes about this whole broad question of human displacement as a result of climate change at a global level. I want to start with a couple of quotes um, from famous physicists, given how much science has been in the news the last few days, with the release of the IPCC alarming sixth report, which uh, in all of its 4,000 pages has about zero good news, has about 4,000 pages of, of horrors and, and misery. Um, Nonetheless, I would urge everybody to have a look at it and uh, at least read its conclusions to fully understand uh, just how serious this crisis is and also to um, hopefully allow you to better influence those who still don't treat it as a crisis, which remains a very large number of people, in particular large uh, institutions and entities that are still not willing to fully alter the behavior that has led us to this point. So the first quote is, uh, I think, rather timely, and, it, and it, it's from Niels Bohr, the famous physicist, and he simply said, um, predictions are notoriously difficult to make, particularly about the future. So it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek quote, but it's so relevant to this situation that we're talking about now, because in fact, he may have been right in many ways, but when it comes to climate displacement, he's, he's inherently wrong because we can make very many quite accurate, unfortunately, predictions about the future of climate displacement and none of them are, are pretty. And I'll go over a few of those in a minute. And the second one, which is related more to how I'll end this intervention and, and, uh, and what we'll eventually be talking about, this idea of safe havens, is from um, Albert Einstein, who famously said, um, nationalism is the most infantile of diseases. It is the measles of humanity. So I think that's also a very timely quote to remind us of, of another element of the era in which we live, an era of rising nationalism and rising authoritarianism and the, the difficulties uh, of democracies to counter that and how important it is for those of us who live in democracies and those of us who believe in democracy to really put forward uh, a vision uh, that will take the wind out of the sails of those that are favoring nationalistic approaches to uh, what are really ultimately global problems affecting the entire human race. So just a few little tidbits on um, on the question of climate displacement. Um, we can't say for sure how many people will be displaced by climate change, but we certainly know that the number is in the hundreds of millions. And then it's just a question of how we ultimately end up defining it. 
uh, whether we mean migration voluntarily, whether we mean actual inundation of land, there's a whole range of criteria you can put against it. But certainly the lowest number that I've seen in recent years, and this number just keeps going up and up and up. When you work in this field, you'll notice over, over 10, 20 years that the initial estimates were way under where they are today. I would say on general terms, the, the lower side of the estimate these days is 250 million. And there are other estimates that go all the way up into, um, what is that, 10 figures, um, over a billion, all depending on how you define it. So even if we were to take the low level, um, this is a, a, an amount of people that is three to four times higher than the entire displaced population of the world today. And we're not doing very well, despite all of Cecilia's efforts <laughs> and many others to resolve internal displacement and also the refugee crisis in the world. Um, if you see how we're doing today on the 80 million people who are either refugees or IDPs, just imagine if that number was tripled or quadrupled or even 10 times higher, and you'll see what we're up against. So, you know, it is alarming, it's huge, it's unprecedented. Um, in my humble opinion, though, we need above all else to really try to start thinking about ways to resolve this problem. Of course, prevent it if at all possible. People should be allowed to stay where they are as long as they possibly can, um, but have pathways open to them, you know, guided by an interventionary positive human rights policy by governments across the world to allow them to pursue pathways that can give them uh, new housing for the housing they're going to lose and new land uh, for the land that they're going to lose. Some of the countries that are you know, really, really affected by this um, more than most would be Bangladesh, for instance, uh, where we work extensively. Um, Current numbers range from 30 to 40 million people facing permanent displacement in Bangladesh. Um, the southern part of Vietnam will almost be entirely inundated. Um, large cities in Asia in particular, um, Bangkok, uh, Jakarta, um, Shanghai, Beijing, a number of other huge mega cities will no longer be habitable in at least some of our lifetimes. Um, it will come as a surprise to many people that um, the government of Indonesia has already made a formal decision to move the entire capital city of Jakarta from the island of Java to another island in the huge archipelago that makes up that country of 240 million people. Jakarta is home in the urban area alone to 12 million people and in, in the broader metropolis, 35 million people, almost as many people as there are in all of Canada. Um, so just imagine the logistics of that exercise. And then you begin to appreciate just the scale of what we are, are dealing with here and how incredibly difficult it's going to be in the long run to manage this. Um, we can come up with all sorts of predictions of what will happen in Jakarta, for instance, and what it will look like in its new destination. Um, and you can, of course, come up with rosy scenarios, but to be pragmatic and realistic, it's not going to be pretty. Clearly, all of the underlying social problems of Indonesian society, as exist in every society, will be augmented by this process. Uh, the wealthy will benefit the military will benefit, um, civil servants to a certain degree will benefit, um, the corporate class will benefit, billionaire class will benefit, and the 99% that aren't part of those <laughs> categories uh, will not. Um, many, many, many people will be left behind in even worse misery than they're enduring now. Um, and overall, we'll have a yet another humanitarian crisis on our hands. And that can be applied across a whole range of different countries, whether it's large scale urban um, decimation like that, or just village by village, household by household, individual by individual, which is already well underway in literally dozens of countries across the world. 
um, it's far more widespread and far more common than people realize. It's not always announced on, on the world's news that people are being relocated or just moving because of, of climate change, and yet they are in country after country, um, including your southern neighbor, and Robin will, I'm sure, talk uh, all about what's happening in Alaska, but also on the eastern seaboard of the United States, which of course ultimately links up to the eastern seaboard of Canada, um, that is one of the most heavily threatened uh, places in the world. Um, and when you look at future projections of sea level rise, um, you'll notice that instead of having that little dangly bit on the lower right hand corner of the United States, it's all nice and smooth and rounded um, because the state of Florida essentially no longer uh, exists. And that's what we're dealing with here. We, you know, at the, a point I always make when I, when I teach and when I'm speaking is, is that our children and most certainly our grandchildren and most, most, most certainly the, the next generation after that will literally grow up in their bedrooms with maps of the world that look fundamentally different than the maps that we all grew up with. I mean, that's the scale of the problem that we're talking about today. I mean, that is just a shocking factoid. The maps of the world are going to have to be rewritten because of rising sea levels. And I'm only talking about that one manifestation of climate change. I'm not talking about droughts and famine and all the other uh, things that can emerge. Um, so it's a truly daunting uh, prospect. If another little factoid worrying is that if all of the world's ice was to melt um, that exists today, sea level rise wouldn't just go up by a few centimeters as is happening now, or maybe one meter by the end of uh, this century, two meters maximum by the end of the, this very century, but sea level will rise 60 meters. Um, and at current levels, the, the melt-off is much, much faster than, than was originally anticipated 25, 30 years ago when the world started looking at this question. So it's not going in a very good direction um, in any way, but we can throw our hands up in the air and, and you know, resign ourselves to this fact, or we can begin to try to do something constructive about it. And that's certainly the approach that we have. And so our basic perspective is every single person displaced by climate change is a, is a human being, is a citizen of, of a country, hopefully, um, and most certainly the holder of rights. And governments across the world need to do a lot more than they've been doing to ensure that these people are treated as rights holders, that they have the mechanisms and the institutions in place and the procedures and the laws and the policies to make sure that nobody ends up homeless or landless as a result of this process and that their rights are protected across the board. And one of the many, many, many different policies we've been working on and looking into is this idea of, of climate displacement havens. So the idea that communities across the world can, in recognition of this problem, um, basically design themselves and then declare themselves to be places where internally displaced people, and in some instances, internationally displaced people could come to and be welcomed to as a part of a solution for their long-term displacement. So, we can go into the nuts and bolts of what that might look like in Atlantic Canada later. Um, but let me just end there for a moment um, with that general overview and then pass the baton on to one of the other speakers. Thank you very much. I think people have frozen, Scott. Um, so I can uh, jump in um, and hopefully other folks will get reconnected. Um, so thanks for that overview, Scott. As, uh, as Scott mentioned, I live and work in Alaska and um, I have um, lived in Alaska for more than 30 years. And um, what's happening in the Arctic should be terrifying everyone, not just those of us who live here. Um, one of the um, things that has mystified me 
is, you know, when the um, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Conference of the Parties, a number of years ago, um, decided, uh, and based on what I've read, it was a number that they drew from a hat, not necessarily scientifically based, that our global temperatures should not increase be beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius, aspirational and uh, two degrees Celsius, you know, as the goal. Um, and what's mystified me is why they are looking at a global average as opposed to what is happening in the Arctic, where the, uh, and Antarctic, where the bulk of ice and snow are. Um, and, uh, you know, it's the air conditioning unit of the world, you know, and, um, and I would say, oh, I would say maybe in the last decade, and I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but um, we've been far beyond two degrees Celsius increase in our winter time. And, um, you know, and as much as five to seven degrees Celsius increase. And when I do presentations, I always start with uh, defining the term polar amplification. Um, because it's a really important word uh, to understand. And it means that, um, and so for years, when I would use that term, um, polar amplification meant that in the Arctic where I live, the temperatures were warming twice as fast as the lower latitudes. Now, scientists are saying we're warming three times as fast as the lower latitudes, which means that in our winter time and Again, I'm in Alaska, um, it rains more than snows. And, um, you know, the, uh, in over Greenland, uh, in the heart of winter, when the sun doesn't shine, um, because we're so far north, the temperatures rise above freezing regularly. So in the heart of our darkness, when there is no solar heat, we are getting temperatures that are above freezing, um, which of course is causing uh, enormous melting. And there was just an article uh, a couple of weeks ago showing that Greenland in one day melted so much ice that it could have covered Florida in uh, a couple of, I, I'm not familiar with the centimeter system and you know I live in the United States, but a couple of inches of water across uh, the land of Florida. And I mention that because um, my concern, and I noticed that there was a question of what, um, you know, what we need to do to get politicians to act. And I think we need to be out in the streets, frankly. I, um, I continue to participate in conversations with scientists who repeatedly say the models that are going to show projected um, climate change in regard to the temperatures are underestimating uh, the, the increase that we have in store. And uh, one of the things, or one of the issues that hasn't been integrated into the models is the what per, thawing permafrost, frozen ground, which uh, makes up most of the Arctic, um, what that is doing to increase carbon and methane emissions. So I start with that because, um, you know, we are in a climate emergency and we're not acting like it. And I include myself. I am so far able to live as I want to live. And I don't take that for granted because I think, um, well, I know that the world in which I live and Scott talked about it in regard to the world, a map of the world. I think of it as the map of human settlements and what human settlements are going to start looking like as increased extreme weather events collide with rising sea levels. Um, and so what's happening here in Alaska is um, there are Alaska native communities that are along the coast. Uh, and because of the rising temperatures, um, Arctic sea ice, which has normally been the barrier, the natural barrier that protects coastal communities from storms. We, um, we don't have hurricanes yet, but we do have storms of uh, high wind events. 
Without that Arctic sea ice, communities get inundated. And uh, working with Alaska Native uh, peoples, we identified uh, the hazard Ustek, U-S-T-E-Q. It's a Yupik word, and it means catastrophic land collapse, because that is actually what's happening along the coast of Alaska and making it impossible for Alaska Native communities to stay where they are. Um, and a few of them have made the decision to relocate. Um, they made the decision decades ago and the US government uh, has recognized the problem and has failed to act. Um, and uh, including, um, you know, we had great hope when President Obama came to the Arctic uh, in 2015, because we thought that was going to be the sure sign that the federal government was actually going to step in and address this issue of relocation caused by the climate crisis. Um, he did not, and uh, it is very uncertain what the Biden administration is going to do. And in the years between 2015 and now, um, as Scott mentioned, now it's the East Coast, you know? I mean, I think those of us in the Arctic knew that the East Coast was in trouble, especially after Hurricane Sandy. Um, but Miami, as an example, Miami is now looking at building a 20 foot seawall to protect Miami. And, uh, and of course, you know, the problem is well, there are many problems, but in Miami, Miami is built on limestone. So the water actually comes up from under the ground. So building a seawall is not going to prevent that from happening. And I just mentioned that because we're just not using the critical thinking that is really required in order to do the problem solving um, and uh, to reimagine what it means to live in a climate altered wor world that is going to be climate altered for many generations into the future. Um, and that um, it's going to take a lot of vision and perseverance um, because based on conversations that I have had with people in the Biden administration, um, there's not going to be a lot of movement and it's, and it's not because of the Biden administration, it's because of others who do not yet recognize we're in a climate emergency and, um, and we need to be acting and creating plans in order to make sure that not only human rights, but that we're addressing the legacies of colonialism and racism that are, um, in my mind, part of the founding reasons why we are in the predicament we are today. I would like to um, come in and good morning from the Philippines, from Asia. Thank you for the invitation to be with you today. And uh, thanks to Scott for giving an overview. And um, I love very much the um, elaboration of Robin with regard to the localization that has actually not only consequences on the people in Alaska and in the area and in the US, but also have obviously consequences for the whole world. And it's the, the examples provided by Scott and Robin really um, emphasize to all of us that we are all in this together and that no one, no one person, no one living, living um, creature on this planet is unaffected. I was trying to read the report of the IPCC and I couldn't go through it because of all the objective, if you want, negativity with no hope in sight. And it is, of course, very easy for all of us as human beings to fall into despair. And I like very much the, um, the question that was posed on the question and answer chat, because it provides that also um, a way that, hey, we can maybe we can still do something about this. 
And thanks very much, Robin. Like you, I'm an activist. And we really do need to step up, continue to step up on our advocacy, not only to expose what's happening, to say, hey guys, this is an emergency, but that something should be done really about it. But what could be done? And that is the, the crux of the question. The topic that we are here to discuss is of course safe havens. And one thing that already bothers me so much is that even though safe havens in Canada or in other parts of the world, now in the Pacific, they're talking about safe havens among certain countries. But that is the crux of the problem is, the crux of the problem for me is this um, clinging to the Westphalian theory of states and that we all have national borders and the national borders practically define what we cannot do, where we can go, where we cannot go. And unfortunately, it's a definition of the state that actually becomes the framework for nationalism. I love the quote that you gave us, Rob, um, uh, Scott, thank you very much. And it is a bane because this is what one factor that practically um, prevents a lot of the politicians to go down to the reality that we are all in this together and not as Canadians or Americans or Indonesians or Australians or, or, um, or Europeans. I'm saying Europeans because now it's more the EU, but also you know, French, Italian, etc. It is, I think that is one thing that, uh, one element that needs to be changed. Maybe we cannot change the whole so national sovereignty framework, but to change the mental attitudes of politicians that this is a nationalist undertaking, this should actually be an international undertaking and not only coming from where we are, as citizens or nationals of a certain country. I, in last year, I, I was as a special rapporteur of the UN on the human rights of internally displaced persons. Um, I presented a report to the UN General Assembly on the adverse effects of slow onset um, climate change on internal displacement. And I always, I always um, uh, confront this issue of national sovereignty because it's not the same, but it has the same mentality. Internal displacement is something that is confined within the borders of a specific country. And what my advocacy and a lot of advocates actually actually um, fight for, including Scott in displacement solutions, is that internal displacement is not merely internal. And this is uh, something that I want to really push for uh, in the advocacy that, that part of our advocacy that we can do together. So the report that I presented to the General Assembly last year, really actually looks at, at slow, um, uh, slow onset events. And, and uh, UNFCC actually defines slow onset events as events that evolve gradually from incremental changes occurring over many years or from an increased frequency or intensity of recurring events. And uh, as Scott rightly says, it's not just water, it's also drought. It's also changing what climate um, or, or weather patterns. And, uh, and, and we can see this all around. Let me tell you a, a very specific story that I actually um, uh, confronted, was confronted with when I went to Niger. And the climate change also just does not happen on its own to people, but it can also be 
um, uh, intertwined with ongoing armed conflict. Yes, we are talking about climate change, but let us also not forget that there are other um, uh, dynamics, unfortunately, happening on this planet that exacerbate or contribute even to climate change. And one of the stories that I would like to uh, share with you before I pass the baton on to another thinker or speaker on this panel. I went to Niger and we all know that there is armed conflict there. But what not many people know is that there is also drought. And the immediate effect of the armed conflict that was um, uh, triggered by non-state ar armed groups, the Boko Haram in the desert, um, was, of course, internal, internally displaced persons who had to flee from their homes. And what did they bring when they had to flee from their homes, when they had to get out of where they were? They, these were pastoralists. And the first, aside from the family, the second thing that they would be bringing with them is are their livestock. And over the years that they have been affected and been hosted by many villages that, have, that, that are around in the desert in Niger, they, their livestock suddenly was slowly rather, slowly uh, lost because they had to sell them um, bit by bit. But they also went back as much as they can to where they came from. And one of the things these pastoralists also may do is go to fish. But they said, we cannot fish anymore. We have lost our, we're starting to lose our livestock because there are less and less deserts to pasture them around. And we cannot fish either because the river, the, the, the lake is getting smaller and smaller. And the smaller that our lakes are, the worse the armed conflict is, because that is where the armed groups are. So with, with this first um, uh, contribution to this panel, there are just two things that I would like to really emphasize. First is that we need to go beyond national thinking of what we can do, we should do. And second, that let us talk, we continue to talk to the people who are really affected. Because when we do talk to these people, we realize that climate change is actually um, part and parcel, not only of our lives, their lives directly, but also what they are already experiencing, including armed conflict. Thank you. So just a quick observation, a quick question. When you talk about continuing to talk, do you have a specific agenda platform to engage local people about those issues that you think have been successful for you? I think that um, all of us here on the panel come from different experiences, different platforms, if you want. Um, in my case, as an international advocate on the human rights of internally displaced persons, one thing that has been successful is to bring the stories of the people themselves to the international community so that we don't see people directly affected merely as statistics, being affected by temperature rise it's not merely a scientific approach, but a human approach. My mandate um, actually provides that I am obliged in my uh, work to mainstream human rights of people, of IDPs into the work that I do. So when we talk about climate change in havens, we should not merely talk about science. We also talk about human rights. And one of the best ways I have found, not so much merely effective, but also um, necessary is to 
really, really say this affects people. And this is how climate change affects people. In reality, in their everyday lives. The persons I was, um, I was talking about when I shared that story about my um, engagement with people in Niger, and I was in this little town of Difa, uh, where roads disappear because the dust from the desert go over the roads again and again. It was very, um, for me, it was also very touching because they were saying, nobody seems to hear us anymore, that there is drought and there is armed conflict at the same time in, in our lives. People seem to think that the problems of climate change, this was told to me by somebody else, was um, th that the problems of drought is actually only in the big cities, but no, it's also in the smallest, um, you know, where we are, which is near the Lake Chad. And these are just very small settlements of people who actually try day by day to make a living and they're not to be bucolic or I ideal, uh, you know, ideally, um, have a romanticized view of it, but they are actually um, comfortable in their way of life as pastoralists. So maybe I may, if I may, since I've got the floor again, Gregory, if I may bring a third element into this, when we are talking about effects of people, we talk about the differentiation of the effects on different people. People in Alaska, where Robin is working, have very different experiences and they have tribes, for example, Alaska tribes. I have been very fortunate and privileged to have met them through Robin, um, where they told me their stories and, um, and, and how they are affected differently. But you go to the pastoralists of the deserts in Niger, they are also affected differently. So the effects on people are also different. They are never uniform. We may have common um, causes and common elements in climate change that drive us to this position that we are in right now. But when it comes to the people themselves, indigenous peoples, for example, tribal um, groups, um, um, pastoralists, see people. Um, I come from an area where there are what we call nomadic sea tribes, and they are affected as well. We call them the Bajau from four different countries in Southeast Asia. And, and, uh, and you go to the Pacific, again, it's a different story for the people themselves. So let us also look at the vulnerabilities, if you want, but also the strengths of specific groups of people who are affected differently. They have different ways of life, different living. And let's get the stories out. And if I may also add in conclusion, they are also part and parcel, part, part of the, uh, sorry, of the, uh, of the struggle and they have they they would like to participate in our in our fight for human rights and justice when we we talk about climate vulnerability thank you very much thank you very much richard what what are your thoughts uh, well i uh, dear friends um, I'm speaking from a, an island, um, uh, part of a group of islands known as the United Kingdom. Uh, this is a Canadian accent, by the way. Um, I think that this um, conversation, and particularly what uh, Cecilia has just been mentioning about the strength and uh, participation of people who are directly affected now 
by this emergency um, brings to mind um, a gentleman who perhaps uh, many of you know, who is now 90 years old. He was in hospital um, last year with COVID and uh, survived. And when he came out, he took the president of Brazil to the International Criminal Court on uh, charges of crimes against humanity. He accused the president of endangering all humanity by the ecocide of the Amazon region. And he said that the indigenous peoples who many people describe as um, the guardians of the forest were the victims of a state policy of murder and forced relocation. Now, on top of that, when he was much younger, uh, that is when he was only 89 years old, he traveled all over Europe meeting heads of state in defense of his home, his home being planet Earth. I found a photo from his uh, campaign and uh, you may be, I hope you're guessing who it is and wondering who it is and thinking, I bet I know, and here he is. It is uh, Chief Rowney, uh, an outstanding uh, human being and the leader of the Kayapo uh, people in the Amazon. And this photo was taken on that European tour where he was, uh, you could say, out in front of the international panel in describing the disaster that uh, not only uh, you could say uh, earth as a, uh, a biological system was facing, but his people and millions of others like him. And to my mind, there's a, there's a direct link uh, between this extraordinary human being and his wisdom and his determination and um, the conversation we're having right now today. Because um, to my mind, the question we're asking ourselves is, Having essentially created this global catastrophe, are we now as a species capable of changing this disastrous trajectory of history? I happen to think the answer is yes. But the question is, how do we dig deep enough into ourselves to find the, the wisdom and determination of an Amazon warrior? Because I do think that is what it's going to take. And my belief is that it's precisely conversations like this, which are, as we all know, now taking place all over the world are part of awakening that wisdom and uh, determination. And I think that uh, later as our conversation goes on, I, I think it will be very important to think of this uh, catastrophe, of course, on the international level as a collective human problem, but also to recall that 
a number of major challenges that have been faced. And I think it will be interesting to go back to the um, overthrow of apartheid. We're embraced as a global struggle and the energy and the victory in that struggle came of course primarily from within the country, but the international support, which was crucial to that, was not so much at the level of international policy making and at the level of national governments, but by the extraordinary coalition of cities, local communities, and individuals which actually deprived the apartheid regime of the ability to continue. So I, I would like to return to that, but my, um, you could say my icon for this, um, perhaps if I'm speaking about South Africa, of course, it would be Nelson Mandela, but in terms of what we're facing today, um, that's why Chief Rowney um, came to my mind. And if in the course of this hour and a half, we get depressed, I'll just pop his picture up. So back to everyone else who is really dealing with this in, on the front lines. Well, here, here is a, something that, that I've been struggling with, with lately. As uh, I spent eight years as a politician and I, a municipal politician, so I have some sense of what's possible at, at the, the local level. And some of my work has been as a, as a consultant at the, the, the federal level with political parties. But at the end of the day, what I always find myself wrestling with is not the political piece as much as the economic piece. The, 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 to me, the, for me, the economic piece has to dramatically change. We hear words about income inequality uh, and uh, uh, the, the, um, the plight of the middle class and the overbearing richness of the upper class. But I continually try and find ways to put in place a new economic model that would not only reduce the amount of carbon, but would create a pool of money to do what I think we're all talking about needs to be done. One of which is to find safe havens, if there's any safe haven. Who finances that? What, what is the role of government in that? And what is the role of private business to do it? And what is the role of individuals in terms of the economic, who pays the cost of that? But I do know if we don't, deal with that issue, the, the true cost with social and environmental collapse is going to be much higher than if we try and do something with it. But, I, but I, as again, as a politician, I was always trying to figure out the economic modeling. And, and I think all of the panelists here have had some level of engagement with economics, either at the United Nations uh, or, or, or the, the state government of, of Alaska, or Scott, you've been all over the world dealing with that. Would anyone like to comment on the economic piece of this, not just the political piece, but what, what are the economic solutions that slow the, the rate of climate destruction and increase possibility or the probability of having resources available to put in place a new narrative, a new plan.
Well, a place where I would start going back to what Cecilia said is with people. And, um, you know, all I can do is speak about what the United States, that's what I know best. And what I know for certain is that in figuring out a climate future, we need to be thinking about reparations and, uh, and revisioning land and land rights because land was stolen from Native Americans and Alaska Natives and um, a capitalist structure imposed. And, um, and so in my mind, you know, I don't, what I would want to do is to have conversations with people who have borne the brunt in the United States of the genocide and slavery and ask them in, in a climate altered world, what would reparations look like? Um, what would getting new housing look like? What does land tenureship need to look like? Because you know, in the United States, um, one of the, I would say, mm, fundamental uh, problems is that everything is pretty much built on individual rights. And you can see that playing out now in how like the vaccine mandates, right? And, um, and individual rights don't get us very far when we're thinking about our collective humanity and what needs to change in order for us to recognize that what happens to Cecilia Scott, Richard, and Gregory also affects me, even though I may not live even remotely close to where all of you live, right? I am deeply connected to every person on this planet. And, um, and so that for me, that would be the beginning of a conversation is what we, what needs to be done to rectify the injustices that still are plaguing our planet and people today um, because of colonialism's roots that are still playing out. Um, if I may, oops. Okay, go ahead, sorry. Sedge. All Where right, I won't, take, I won't take too long. Um, but thank you very much, Robin, um, on starting off in this. Um, and indeed, I was even looking, um, there was something in, in chat in the chat box um, and um, emphasizing uh, what Gregory has just said also with regard to the role of economics and neoliberalism. And I like very much that Robin actually went straight into the aspect as to what those economics would also mean for the people themselves. And just, um, just to uh, add to what Robin said, um, one of the advocacies that are being pushed around uh, with regard to climate change is that actually the issue of loss and damages, which is not very high on the agenda of the international community. Of course, it's not directly into neoliberalism and, uh, and into the economic structures that we have, but it is one of the, only one, but an important um, one starting point with regard to the economics, so to speak, of um, looking into the effects of climate change. Unfortunately, loss and damages has been seen by many states around the negotiating table as merely one, oh, you're just trying to get money from the rich countries, one, which is actually for me a very disgusting attitude because if we are going to break this nationalist thinking that we are not connected to each other, you know, then it is really part and parcel. We have to, to really push, if you want, um, this distribution of wealth and the concentration of the wealth in some countries to the areas where it is most needed. And that is partly breaking this, this framework of neoliberalism. But secondly, 
the attitude of many uh, states towards loss and damages is really more looking at quantifiable loss and damages. So I would even say, Robin, it's not just the loss of housing, loss of lands, but also the loss of community identity that goes about, that comes about rather, because of displacement, because of the effects of climate change, the loss of way of life, that is not quantifiable. Of course, it would be very much challenging. You know the loss, you know the damages, how do we compensate for that? But thirdly, is of course, these are loss and damages. And definitely, I would agree with what Robin said about transitional justice. And this is, again, an element that we can start really looking into um, more seriously, because uh, the more that we do not look at what is happening, had been happening already and still happening, we will never, ever, ever go and, and think to the future because we think, oh, it happened in the, in, in the past. It's not going to happen again. No, sorry, the past always, always have an effect on the now and the future. And the climate change emergency is, um, is, is a, a, a rouge fill. It's, it's, it's the red line for all of this. Thanks. Um, thank, thanks to everybody for your excellent comments and, and um, analysis. You know, just a few general points trying to link it all up. You know, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, I have, I, I'm the head of this organization called Displacement Solutions, but I also have another NGO and it's called Oneness World, you know, and it's all about world citizenship and how we move from our nation states into that. So, you know, it's so you cannot believe how pleasing it is to me to hear the August panel members all universally speaking in these very same terms, um, because I really believe that, you know. Now, I am totally not at all a believer in aliens. I mean, they're probably there, but, you know, until I see one, I'm not going to believe in them, just like levitating. You got to, I want to see somebody levitate before I believe in it. Now, but let's just imagine for a second there were aliens, and they finally made it to Earth, and they're hovering above Earth in their spaceship, and they're looking down, I mean, what is their reaction going to be? Like, it's going to be, it's like that famous, uh, you know, Twilight Zone episode from the 1960s where there's aliens looking down, just flabbergasted that this, this unique species called Homo sapiens has absolutely everything at its disposal for universal infinite paradise in for millennia to come. And yet, they're bickering, they're fighting, they're hating, they're exploiting, they're destroying, they're pillaging, they're digging out holes in the ground, and they're ruining it. So, I mean, we need all kind of to play the alien every so often and look down and say, what is going on, you know? And one thing we really need to focus on is, you know, this is the Anthropocene that we're living in. We are living in the first era where one species completely is responsible for altering the global environment. I mean, this is a staggering thing, you know? And then if we break it down, you know, so sorry, billionaires but and millionaires, but, you know, the top 1% of the of human race is responsible for more than 70% of the world's emissions. So this is not an equitable question here. You know, on, on these charts, when you look at the small island nations, Kiribati, Tuvalu, Marshall Islands, Tokelau, they literally are responsible for 0.0000001% of global emissions. You know, United States, China now by far the leading e emitter, European Union close behind. Those countries are the ones that just keep on churning it out. The day the IPCC report was released a couple of days ago, you know, I'm speaking to you as great as Australia is in many ways. On climate change, it's the worst. And the state that I live in, Victoria, which is otherwise a very progressive state, is the worst yet. We are the worst political jurisdiction in the world for per capita CO2 emissions. And so it, Extinction Rebellion and a number of other groups in Canberra, the capital of Australia, 
graffitied the parliament building. Oh my goodness, what a crime, you know? And it's all it said was duty of care. That's what it said, duty of care, a couple of places. One woman lit a baby carriage on fire, you know, proclaiming her alarm at the situation and what it's doing to the world's children. This is the only thing that the, that the prime minister and others commented on in response to the IPCC report. Just to show you how far we have to go, it's like, these vandals, they've destroyed public property, you know? Um, but nothing, nothing whatsoever about how Australia is directly responsible for such a huge portion, disproportionate proportion of um, global emissions. So it's important to remember that. It's important to remember also CO2 emissions have not gone down at all since the, the Paris Agreement in 2015. I mean, so anybody who holds out hope that the Paris Agreement is going to be this panacea for solving the problem is, is unfortunately um, unrealistic. It's important to remember that that famous book, I think it was Why Civil Resistance Works or something like that, where they did this analysis of like 200 years of, of, of uh, public protests against various um, manifestations of evil, whether it was you know, slavery or, or discrimination against women or, or apartheid or what have you. And you know, basically what they found was not only did, was nonviolence far more effective than violence in, in promoting positive change, which is an excellent conclusion, um, but also if you could just get 3.5% of your population onto the streets on any given day, you had something in the range of a 90 plus percent chance of achieving whatever objective it was that you wanted. So, you know, it is starting to happen. You know, I mean, Extinction Rebellion is doing things. You know, Greta Thunberg and, and Friday for the Future is, is doing things. Um, even some governments are starting to do things. Ordinary people in, in places are changing their behaviors and doing things. You know, I believe the people that want planet Earth to survive and who want climate change to be conquered are in a great majority compared to those who want to continue with business as usual. And, and yet those who want to continue with business as usual um, and everything that's occurred, you, you know, most of the world's emissions that have ever been released into the atmosphere happened from 1990 onwards. It's not something that's like from the pre-industrial age or from you know Manchester, England in the 1850s when the industrial age began. It's happened in very recent times. So, you know, we really need this idea of, of, of course, you know, we can talk about what are still esoteric notions of world citizenship, getting rid of nation states, eroding sovereignty, and all that. Is, and you will never find anybody who believes more in those things than I do. Um, but you know, I also have to be a little bit pragmatic and, and practical and say, you know, what can we do about it today, practically speaking? And we have to speak in these terms, of course, but what can we do and what should we do? And so just to bring it back you know, to this idea of climate displacement havens, as bad as the macro level is, um, you know, to us, it seems a very positive contribution to be able to instill in people across the world that everybody has to have somewhere safe to go. That if they're going to be displaced, the slum should not be the only option. And that is the default option for 99% of the people in the developing world who are being displaced by climate change. They're not moving to another village location where they can continue to be a fisher folk family. They're moving into the capital city and moving into a slum and changing everything about their whole life. So we need to have alternatives to that. And in a world where many parts of the world, um, granted mostly developed countries such as Japan, Italy, you know, Germany, Canada to a certain extent, Australia most certainly, people are moving out of rural areas. People are moving out of small towns and into big cities. And they're desperate actually for, for replenishment of their population. And so you know, why not try to use that phenomenon as one way to induce communities that can benefit from this uh, to welcome and provide pathways and viable livelihoods to um, people who are no longer able to live um, where they're living now. 
and do it in, you know, obviously it has to be done in the right way, it has to be done with adequate planning and adequate forward thinking and it has to be adequately financed and all of those matters. Um, but it's one way, it's one concrete way by which um, communities everywhere can begin to become part of the process. And as people settle there, as people augment the local population, one of the key elements of this whole idea is that that very process can induce totally pro-ecological, anti-climate change, sustainable ways of developing human settlements in terms of the buildings where people live, the neighborhoods where they live, the amount of trees that are planted, um, and so forth. So there's a million other things I can say, but I'll let, just leave it. At. I'll, I'll give you one other example of just how weird the world is. When, one of the last times I was in Kiribati in the middle of the Pacific, you know, 100,000 people, most definitely one of the most threatened countries in the world. By, by, by total chance, Ban Ki-moon, the former uh, Secretary General of the UN, arrived in Kiribati when we were there. And you know that's never happened before. It's a bit like Obama coming to Alaska. You know, it never happened that a Secretary General went anywhere to the small island nations like that. And he was in an Australian military plane. And you know they only get a one plane, two planes a week. You know in Kiribati, so it was a big thing. And the whole country almost gathered around the runway, and um, and welcomed Ban Ki Moon. And they thought their problems were solved and and everything. And then. Um, one of the funny things we saw is like we, we saw this security guy come out of Ban Ki Moon's um, hotel room. I mean, this is like hotel room. There are no no resorts in Kiribati, let's say, very basic. And we're like, hey, what were you doing in Ban Ki Moon's room? And he goes, oh, I just put a I just put a lifesaver in there in case sea level rises when he happens to be on the island, you know? So this is like, just to show you the absurdity of the whole thing, he actually put one of those life-saving rings into Ban Ki-moon's room in case there was either a tsunami or a quick, you know, rising of the seas when the secretary general happened to be there just to, you know, make sure he, did, you know, he was off the hook. So, I mean, that's the era we're living in. We're living in a crazy era when it comes to, um, these questions and we're not nearly doing enough. And, and clearly the big culprits um, need, to be, need to do the most. And the only way they will do that is if much larger numbers of people make it known that they're no longer gonna stand for the climate crisis that has been foisted upon them. Thank you. I, I wondered, um... Although, although Gregory, although Scott has brought us back around to the central question, you had asked a question about economics. And I wanted to just contribute a short point on that. Um, and actually others and perhaps people on this, uh, on this gathering may know more about this uh, than I do and particularly where it's at right now. But in the midst of, uh, I don't, I'm not exactly sure in a historical perspective, when the midpoint in the COVID crisis is, but uh, within the last uh, 18 months, say, approximately in the middle of that, um, I was asked to uh, speak to, um, on Zoom, to the uh, business school <laughs> in um, the leading uh, university in Morocco which has now introduced a, a compulsory uh, course for every student uh, in the business school on um, well, basically what I think many people would call uh, corporate social responsibility. And um, when I was doing some research, you know, to um, try and find a point where you know, those students in the business school would intersect with this uh, issue. Um, I came across articles in, certainly in the English speaking world uh, uh, press, a uh, business press that said that there had been a significant change in the pattern of investment during the COVID period. Uh, I think this was after about the first year of it. 
um, of people significantly shifting their investments away from um, you know uh, fossil fuel industries and others, but more significantly, it was what they were shifting their investments towards, which was essentially um, renewable resources and uh, companies or or funds that were directed uh, towards solutions to the climate uh, crisis. And it actually showed that those, uh, at least the charts at that time showed that the companies or investment funds that would include pension funds, which um, had not at all addressed this issue, were actually on a downward curve in terms of return on investment, which to me was, I, I'm not an expert in this field, but it was quite startling because you tend to think that if anybody was alert to trends, it would be those folks. They seem to be missing this shift. And actually very small funds, but which were specifically directed toward, towards enabling people to, if you like, vote with their funds on these issues were on a significant uptake. Now, I don't know if that is, um, you know, like uh, claiming that spring is on the way because we have seen a few um, early uh, flights of birds. Uh, and whether that pattern has been sustained. But I just wondered if anyone else had had seen this because, um, and then I'll close the, this came up in a conversation with um, a friend of mine in, in the Netherlands who was literally tearing out whatever remains of his hair about what he could do um, in view of this catastrophe. And, uh, and he, he and I mentioned this to him and he said, oh, well, the largest pension fund in the world is in the Netherlands. And I said, brother, get them to disinvest. And he went, okay, I'm on it. So I just wondered if this, uh, this, this phenomenon is showing up in, in what other, other friends are noticing either on this panel or um, in, in the people who are with us online. So sorry, I'm gonna like go back to Scott about the climate havens, um, because I hope in, you know, thinking about the Atlantic as a possible climate haven, that you are in conversation with the First Nations peoples of those lands, to seek their uh, input and guidance and uh, leadership in making uh, in yeah making sure that they are leading whatever it is you think they are you are conceiving in a climate haven. Uh, I'm really glad that you're thinking about this in regard to structural issues in regard to economies and laws, because this, it, it's in my mind, if we have any future at all, it's going to require a complete transformation of the paradigm in which we currently live. And, um, and again, in my, in my mind, indigenous peoples need to be leading us and how to do that transformation. Um, so, that would be my reflection about climate havens. <laughs> um, very good point, Robin, as always. Now, I, I think there's a, there's a legal term called fruit from the poison tree, which some of you may have heard of and some of you haven't heard of. And I think we have to remember that one. You know, so it's like the proceeds of crime. If you if you get rich from buying something that somebody stole, then you too are guilty by association. So in, in effect, 
we can see the almost the entire world as 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 constituting the wealth that we have is fruit from the poison tree because so much of the world has ultimately been stolen right so i mean we're talking about the ultra of ultra macro issues here um but if there was ever a time to address huge issues like that it's now you know and and going back to the whole question of of first nations people aboriginal people indigenous people you know they were on the country where I am now for at least 68,000 years. Imagine that. And they had political institutions in place and they had ways of engaging with one another and they had ways of relating to the natural environment which are almost impossible for non-Indigenous people to even understand. Um, the most important of which of course is a similar trait that all Indigenous people everywhere have which is you simply cannot separate the human from the land from which they come. They're one and the same. You take someone off their land, you, you're tearing them in half, effectively. Land and humans are the same. And we need in a way to get back to that way of thinking. And, and, and remember that, you know, indigenous peoples globally have been decimated, crushed, for hundreds of years. And this was even, you know, the very first thing I ever did in international law terms was in 1986 <laughs> uh, to go to a meeting to revise the main international treaty on indigenous populations as they were called at the time, which was premised on the idea that they should be assimilated into dominant society and basically bred out of existence. Imagine that, that was the primary way of looking at indigenous peoples all the way up until this convention started being revised in 1986. So it's important to remember, things really have advanced in many really fundamental ways in terms of recognition of indigenous rights, um, but we still have a very long way to go. Of, I mean, the depth of the discrimination against all indigenous groups is so deep and so widespread and so global, and we mustn't neglect to remember that but we also mustn't neglect to remember the amount of incredible wisdom that they all have regarding ultimately solutions to the kind of issues that we're looking at here, you know, and finding a way to, you know, emphasize those, not in any sort of romanticized way, because, you know, there are many problems in indigenous societies as there are in, you know, white dominant societies. Um, but at the same time, you know, let's really rely on the best that indigenous people and all people have to put on the table. And let's take an, you know, what's called an integral approach to this and pluck the best stuff out. And we put the best stuff together in a, in a recipe, maybe we can find, you know, find a way forward. And you know, if COVID and climate change together don't, aren't enough for more of us to realize that we're on one single solitary lonely blue and green orb floating in space in and amongst two trillion galaxies. There are two trillion galaxies, my goodness sakes. And we're in one of them. And we're the only one that has life on it as far as we know. There's probably more, but that's all we know. And look what we're doing to it. I mean, it's shocking. And that's the point that everybody has to reach, you know? That it, and, and as bad as the human race is, and as cruel as we are, we've made incredible advancements too, you know? And it's probably a species worth saving. Emphasis on probably. <laughs> um, but we need to really get back to big thinking and big ideas and big movements and something that really binds the entire human race together. And if COVID and climate change can't do that, you know, short of aliens invading planet earth um i don't know what could well it, it's interesting these uh you know this is our fourth or excuse me our fifth dialogue and um uh, and all of those dialogues have kind of i think now that i look back on them have led up to this discussion how do we in a sense home or rehome people in the, in the very the very first dialogue, and Scott was a, 
a part of that one was on governance. And I think the general feel of that discussion was there currently does not exist a political system that's capable of dealing with the climate crisis. Uh, and I, I know in a discussion that we had a couple of weeks ago with this panel uh, that, 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 that I at one time thought the United Nations might be that sort of governance piece. I, I'm not sure that it is in some of these discussions. So that, so that was the, the, the political piece that, that, that it, it, we do not have that system in place now. It's something that's gonna to have to be invented, rekindled, reorganized. So there's that piece. The second one was on economics. And it was clear to the, to the panelists that the endless growth economic model will not work. That a steady state economy based on ecological principles and with a steady population, a steady rate of consumption is what's necessary and possible. The third discussion was on the legal rights for nature. And uh, that, that without that piece, this preservation of sacred spaces is probably not going to happen. And the, and the other part of that is litigation. How do you begin to wrestle control from large corporations back into the hands of people? Litigation may be a, a mechanism to do that. And that conversation ended up with something that is absolutely fascinating to me. And that's the drafting of an ecological constitution. That, that really deprioritizes private rights and, uh, and, and um, uh, starts to, to talk about the, the rights of nature in a constitutional context. And the, the dialogue just before this one, a couple of weeks ago, were on the built environment. How do you design new buildings? Where do you design them? And how do you make sure that those designs are inclusive of all people, particularly indigenous people, people with disabilities, people with no money? Uh, and how are those communities designed, not only in urban centers, but in rural centers where transportation is a difficult issue? And then we, we have this piece of, of creating a safe haven if I bring all those pieces together, the, the governance piece, the economic piece, the, the legal rights for nature, the ecological constitution, and building living buildings and living communities, bring all that together and, and, and try and think about that. Is Atlantic Canada capable of doing all of that? And even if we were, for whatever reason, what's the next step? How, do, how does any place on earth, how does Atlantic Canada, in a sense, open its head and its heart to people that need to be rehomed? And how do you psychologically prepare people to leave home? I, I think I can't remember who brought it up about your pastoral people. You can't just pick people up that were pastoral people and move them here and say, gosh, I, I'm sure you'll make it because there's new opportunities here in the financial sector or the, or the telecommunication sector. They're, they're people whose livelihood is deeply rooted in, um, in the pastoral landscapes. So all of that said, and then you've got the spiritual component and the differences in spirituality. How do you begin to mesh all of that? I think it's possible. And I think Scott, in some of your work, you've started to lay that out. Research base, we, we need to figure out who's willing. We had this discussion and when I was a municipal counselor that there were some people were prepared to accept refugees, which is good. But when it came down to it, and then the question was how many, and some of the discussions were, well, I think here, 
in this county, we'd have room for three or four families. And yet I hear Scott telling us that, that you know, at the, at the largest end of the scale, a seventh of the world's population are gonna to have to relocate to a map that's been redrawn. So my, my dilemma is always, how do you put all the, the governance, the economic, the social justice, the spiritual peace into a new place and attract the people that you need and not just thinking of cheap farm labor, but people who are fully incorporated into a new community. That's the magnitude of the problem for me. I think it's necessary for these safe havens, but getting from point A to point B is becoming very challenging for me. So if any, if any of the panelists have a, a, any points of beginning on, on where we would start here locally to do that or where you would start locally, it would be helpful to hear that. So I'm gonna repeat myself because in my experience, um, and you know, and I say this, uh, especially in the context, and for those of you outside of North America, uh, you may not know that in the past month, uh, indigenous peoples in Canada have discovered the grave sites of children murdered at the residential schools. And so I, uh, taking that into context, I think in order for us to vision a world where there is true justice and equity, we have to undo, we have to first know the legacies of harm and horror in the places where we live, um, you know, and, and then um, figure out what needs to be done to rectify them. And as I said, I mean, I don't know the indigenous peoples of the land where you are, but I would start conversations with them because we know that they have been removed from their lands. And so you're talking about building a safe haven on lands that aren't yours to build on since it's unceded land. Um, and that's, that is where the hard work is because we, we have to, in my mind, in order to create this vision of a world that we want of justice and equity, we've got to do a way better job of building coalitions amongst all the different types of people who have experienced the horrors of misogyny and racism and colonialism and create a true dialogue to understand what needs to happen in order to rectify those injustices. Because unless we do that, we're going to create a vision of the world as it currently exists. And this world is not one that I want replicated in my future at all. Um, and so that would be my suggestion. And I'm sure there are indigenous peoples where you live, who would be interested in starting that conversation? I, I appreciate that. And I think you're, you're right on target. You know, the Center for Local Prosperity has been engaged in that now for four or five years. And, and uh, we take a lot of leadership from a couple of elders that are, that are giving us some, some guidance on that. That indigenous piece, the, the unceded territorial piece, is, is big, tremendous power associated with that, uh, that, um, that, that, uh, that I've been really awakened to lately. I'll just, uh respond to that quickly. I couldn't agree more. Um, I, you know, just imagine the, the possibilities of uh, addressing several problems simultaneously, basically, in a positive way, you know, addressing, you know, unresolved land claims, 
ethnic cleansing, benefiting from fruit from the poison tree, resolving climate displacement, dealing with declining populations and declining economic bases and putting it all together. If it was to work even at a small scale in a place like Atlantic Canada, just imagine the potential ripple effects that it could have globally, where you simultaneously address the, you know, one of the deepest issues in the world, indigenous land rights, together with comprehensively addressing, at least in a local context, uh, the question of climate displacement. Th that's got an immense power behind it, immense. And you know, you might not always necessarily get the outcome that you may desire, particularly with regard to the legal ownership, property ownership questions of indigenous land, which remains so controversial globally, um, but it will certainly chip away at it. You know, it will most certainly push things in the, in the right direction. So, you know, I would say total support for that idea from, from my side. Uh, uh, Gregory, in, um, you know, in answer to your mind boggling question, um, which I think applies to what everyone has said, um, and I'm not quite sure how to do it, but I, I wanted to mention it. You know, if you go, um, if you go to Paris and you <clears throat> go to the headquarters of, uh, UNESCO outside there's these words engraved from the um, preamble of the charter of UNESCO, the United Nations Economic, Social, um, I mean, Economic, uh, Scientific and Cultural Organization, right? Um, it says, uh, uh, here's a, it's in French, uh, the translation would be, since wars begin, in the human mind, it is in the human mind that the defenses of peace must be constructed. Now, you know, this is worth bearing in mind, I think, because for example, what everyone has so articulately spoken about on a certain level comes down to attitude um, I mean, you could say that a safe haven is a state of mind. Uh, that includes the willingness to make the leap that Robin described so eloquently, which is to examine, you know, centuries of layered Uh, prejudice, or you could say hatred towards others, and to reverse what we see happening at this very moment, regardless of this impending um, intensification, which is so many countries in the most grotesque ways closing their borders to people who are fleeing uh, horrific brutality. Now I have, I personally have a great deal of respect for all the, you know, the practical layers, which you, which Gregory laid out from the previous conversations. And, um, but I, I, I'm listening to this, I'm, I'm sort of driven to this quote from UNESCO because I'm wondering if there isn't an under a fundamental, you know, misshapen view of life that makes all these horrors possible, including the destruction of the planet, and whether at some level that hasn't got to be changed. Otherwise, it will be a collection of people of goodwill 
who see this vision, but isn't there some kind of reorienting of the human mind? And I don't know if that's too large uh, for the remaining part of this conversation, but there are some profound attitudes which essentially see planet Earth as inanimate and other people as aliens, indeed enemy aliens. And, and um, without confronting that in some way, I just wonder how, how much progress can be made in the, what you might call the technical areas. And I don't use technical to uh, diminish them. I'm just meaning in order to move forward with that and get some kind of energy, isn't there something and, and finally, th that I feel is very much related to what Robin said, because at least as far as I'm aware, one thing that many, many, many of the Earth's First Nations or Indigenous peoples or original peoples, whatever term you wish to use, have in common is a profound orientation towards all life, all forms of life, which includes animate and inanimate on this planet, being, if we can use for a moment, uh, a term which could be seen as religious, sacred. In other words, that it is inconceivable that you would harm it. So I don't know if, if, if I've bitten off more than I or anyone else can chew here, but that's what came to my mind. Well, I, I, I think, Richard, that's a great place to end and it's a great place to begin because I've always felt that at some point the, uh, the environmental crisis is really a spiritual crisis. Uh, and, at the end of the day, that, that that's where I end up spending my energy. So, Richard, thank you very much. And Cecilia, thank you very much. Robin, thanks for your good work and taking the time. And uh, as always, Scott, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to spend uh, spend time with you. So I would like to, uh, to close tonight with um, a little four minute video that, that for me is, is a powerful statement. Uh, and again, I, I, I thank you all and I thank all the, the participants online who have stayed with us over the last eight weeks. So if, if I could, I would, um, um, ask Melissa to, to share with us this video. And with that, I wish you all well. Time, then there's renewal time. We are getting very close to this time. We were told that we would see America come and go. And in a sense, America is dying from within because they forgot the instructions on how to live on Earth. Everything is coming to a time where prophecy and man's inability to live on earth in a spiritual way will come to a crossroad of great problems. It's the hope we believe, it's our belief that if you're not spiritually connected to the earth and understand the spiritual reality of how to live on earth, it's likely you will not make it. When Columbus came, that began 
what we term as the First World War. That was the true First World War when Columbus arrived. Because along with him came everybody from Europe. By the end of the Second World War, we were in America, we were only 800,000 from 60 million to 800,000. So we were almost exterminated here in America. Everything is spiritual. Everything has a spirit. Everything, everything was brought you by the creator, the one creator. Some people call him God. Some people call him Buddha. Some people call him Allah. Some people call him other names. We call him Tonkashila, grandfather. We're here on earth only a few winters. Then we go to the spirit world. The spirit world is, is more real than most of us believe. The spirit world is, is everything. Over 95% of our body is water. And in order to stay healthy, you gotta drink good water. When the European first came here, Columbus, we could drink out of any river. If the Europeans had lived the Indian way when they came, we'd still be drinking out of water because water is sacred. The air is sacred. Our DNA is made of the same DNA as the tree. The tree breathes what we exhale. When the tree exhales, we need what the tree exhales. So we have a common destiny with the tree. We are all from the earth. And when the earth, the water, the atmosphere is corrupted, then it will create its own reaction. Mother is reacting. In the Hopi prophecy, they say the storms and floods will become greater. To me, it's not a negative thing to know that there will be great changes. It's not negative. It's evolution. When you look at it as evolution, it's time. Nothing stays the same. You should learn how to plant something. That's the first connection. You should treat all things as spirit. Realize that we are one family. Thank you very much.